live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network, located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now, from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Glad that you are with us tonight. I'm Mike Hickson, and we're going to be talking tonight about the judgment, and we hope you'll stay tuned for the next hour. This is a really, really important subject, and so we want to deal with it biblically. Uh, we want to think about some things that no doubt are sobering with regard to the afterlife and uh, meeting God on that great and final day. If you have questions tonight or comments, please feel free to call us at 888-805-3390. You may email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. We would love to take your questions tonight as we think about this very important subject, the judgment. We have with us tonight Robert Williams, and Robert, good to be with you. You've been with us on a number of occasions. We're so glad to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Good to be here. Yes, sir. We also have with us Mike McDaniel, and Mike has been with us before, and Mike is also the host of another television program, A Bible Answer, and he has done over 800 programs alone. They do a great work, and so uh, I want to say just how welcome we are or how grateful we are to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on, and I appreciate GBN. You know, a Bible answer is seen throughout the week on GBN, uh, 10 a.m. on Sundays, 3 o'clock on Mondays and Wednesday afternoons, 2 o'clock on Saturdays, and then for you, uh, for you late-nighters, 1 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday, you can watch a Bible answer. So uh, we appreciate that. It's great to be on, and uh, hello from everybody in Carothersville, Missouri, uh, where I live. Um, I'm uh, excited to be on with Brother Williams. I've not had the opportunity to be with Brother Williams, but we have something in common because Brother Williams and I are both graduates of the Memphis School of Preaching. I graduated in 1985, and Brother Williams graduated in 1989. Of course, I also teach for the school, and I just wanted to say that due to COVID and the various shutdowns and, and the lack of speaking engagements, our faculty has not been able to recruit uh, like we normally would, and there may be those that are watching this program tonight who might have some interest in, uh, in becoming a gospel preacher and attending our two-year program, or maybe there might be some interest in evangelism and doing mission work, sure. whether stateside or overseas. I teach in the World Missions Program, which is a one-year program at the School of Preaching. And so if there's anybody that is at all interested, uh, please contact the school and we will be glad and happy to send you a packet. And, and I know that uh, even if I didn't teach for the school, I know how much I appreciate the school and the difference it's made in my life. And I know it's made a difference in Brother Williams' life as well. No doubt about it. I, I often tell the story of how, how blessed I was to attend the Memphis School of Preaching. It was indeed the best decision I ever made in my life. I was working as an engineer at the time for Mississippi Power and Light Entergy. And of course, when I left my job to go to school, people thought that, you know, I had my uh, priorities mixed up. But I understand. I understood that an opportunity to study the Bible for two years. And while you're studying the Bible, you're also going to be supported by brothers and sisters uh, in the church. Mm -hmm. right, fellow brothers and sisters, and you're going to have that foundation of the Bible to carry with you the rest of your life. And I have said many times, had I not had that foundation of the Memphis School of Preaching, being a bivocational minister for over 30 years, I don't know how I would have made it. Well, and you know, mm -hmm. you think about that two-year investment that you made. Both of you gentlemen have been preaching for over 30 years. Right. Yes. And the countless lives that you've impacted I have no doubt that there will be people in heaven because of your efforts. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you recognize the need to study, to prepare yourself, and then to preach the gospel, I don't know of a greater calling than to preach the gospel Amen. of Christ. Amen. So what a no great doubt. blessing. Mm -hmm. Tonight, as we think about the judgment of God, when you think about the judgment, initially, what comes to mind? Well, you know, uh, when you think of judgment, you know, it's used in several ways in the Bible. Sometimes it's individual. Sometimes it talks about countries being uh, basically uh, 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 punished for their rebellion. 
But tonight, I, I'm thinking of the judgment as the final day, the very last day, the day when God announces that tomorrow has been canceled, and we're going to stand before the great judgment seen of Christ, and all things are going to be made right mm -hmm. and That's true. justified. All of the injustices of this life will be made right on that great and final day. Mike, as you think about the judgment, and I know that we live in a culture today in which spiritual things have in many ways been set to the side. Mm -hmm. So how do we get people back in tune with spiritual things and remind them or point out to them that there is a, coming, there is a, a day coming in the future in which we will stand before the judge of all the earth? Well, that's a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer. There are some people that are so stubborn and hard-hearted, it seems like they won't be reached. But you know, when, when we look at the, at the world and we see the injustice of the world, there's got to be some point in time when the books are going to be balanced. True. I mean, is, there not just, is God not a just God? Is there not justice? And uh, you've heard the story probably about the atheist farmer and he ridiculed people who believed in God, you know, and he said, I plowed on, on Sunday and I planted on Sunday and I cultivated on Sunday and, and I hauled in my crops on Sunday, but, but I never went to church on Sunday, you know, and uh, I harvested more bushels per acre than, than anybody else, more than these God-fearing people, and, and never missed a service. And, and the guy wrote this letter to the editor and stated all that to the editor, and the editor said, well, he, he, he put a note that said, God doesn't always sell his accounts in October. That's true. <laughs> that's, right. that's true. And that's true. It is I true. I mean, you look at, um, what is it, Psalm 73? where you have ASAP, and he's talking about the prosperity of the wicked, and he's having a problem with that. He's wrestling with that, you know. Right. But then he comes down to it, and he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, mm -hmm. and then I understood the, their end. In other words, it's not till, till we worship God and we study, study God's will and we get our heads right, right. you know, in the right perspective from, from God's viewpoint, because this life is not all there is. That's exactly right. And, and there's, there's got to be justice, and there's got to be that settling of accounts. That's right. You know, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the writer said, It is appointed unto man once to die. After that comes the judgment. Mm -hmm. And so to think that there is a day, you know, Paul said, every knee will bow, mm -hmm. every tongue shall confess to God. And so there are people in the world today that give little or no thought to spiritual things. They're not interested in spiritual things. But to understand that there's coming a day that you will bow in the presence of the Lord and you will acknowledge Him as Lord of all. That's right. That is sobering. I think that was one of the woes that Amos uh, said, woe unto them that put far away the evil day. So men like to, like to believe that there won't be a judgment uh, as if because they don't want to be accountable for their actions in this life. But, you know, the judgment is not necessarily a thing to be feared. It's something to be looked forward to for those. And I think Paul talked about that in the book of Romans chapter 2. Uh, if you will, mm -hmm. let me read that. I don't know. Uh, Romans chapter 2, notice in verse 5. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasure it up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, mm -hmm. to them who by patience, continuance, and well-doing seek for glory and honor uh, and immortality, eternal life. So for those of us who are living faithfully, we're looking for eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, those who do not accept the truth and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So it's, a, it's going to be like a two-edged sword. You're right. You're exactly right. You know, and in that context, mm -hmm. Paul points out the standard by which we're going to be judged mm -hmm. is truth. 
Because in verse 2, he said, we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. That's right, truth. And Jesus defined truth as his word in John 17, 17. And so doesn't that say something about how our lives ought to be, our lives ought to be in harmony with God's holy word? You know, to become a Christian, we've got to confess our faith in Jesus Christ, don't we? Right. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If we confess him now, he'll confess us in the there and then. But if we don't, what will happen? He'll deny us mm -hmm. in, in the there and then. And I think about, you know, you mentioned confessing at the judgment. I was looking the other day at the two passages that talk about us buying the D and, and confessing. You've got Philippians 2.10, which says all should bow. And then you've got Revelation 14, 11, which says all shall bow at the day of judgment. Shall bow is in the indicative mood. So Philippians, they should bow, but if not, they shall bow. That's right. That's right. They shall bow. There's not going to be any atheists or infidels or agnostics that are not going to be bowing because everybody is going to know the truth of the matter mm -hmm. on, on the day of judgment. And I think about, in my study of church history, about how, you know, confession was the defining point. These Roman rulers would call in our brothers and sisters and say, will you deny Christ? And when they wouldn't, when they confessed Christ, they went to their deaths. True. And they're going to be there on the day of judgment. That's right. And, and, and I think about all these who died for their faithfulness to Christ, and, and they made that confession when they knew that death was going to be the result of that, and they didn't renounce their Lord, and they were faithful unto death, which is the meaning of Revelation 2.10. That's right. It's not faithful until, it's faithful unto, and they were faithful unto death. And you know, Mike, I wouldn't want to face those people in the day of judgment, uh, knowing that um, I either had not confessed my Lord or else had not been faithful to that confession. I mean, where am I going to stand in compared to those that died for it? That's right. You know, in the book of Revelation, John, of course, is writing, and the backdrop is persecution. Mm -hmm. God's people were being persecuted, some being martyred. And you remember over in chapter 14, verse 13, he said, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. He said, Yes, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And you know, there are only two ways to die, either in Christ or out of Christ. Right. And you think about those Christians in the first century, they were being met with, with as you said a moment ago, you know, they've, either, they've got to make a decision. Am I going to renounce Christ or will I be faithful to Christ? And what John's saying is, look, if you die for the cause of Christ, then you're going to a blessed state and to know that there's something greater that awaits you. Right, right, and and their works are going to follow them. I, I look at that. And I think they're going to follow them right on up to the judgment day. That's right, right. that's what I think the intent of that verse is. They're going yeah. the works are going to follow them right on up to the judgment day. You know, you think about Lydia, and when she died, what what were those women looking at? The coats. They looked at her works. That's right. That's right. That she did while she was with them. Well, what about at the judgment day? Right. They'll follow her right up to the judgment day too, as, as not being saved by those works, but as a result of the, there being a living faith. That's true. Making her faith alive. You know, in the book of Revelation, over in chapter 20, John said he saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And then he said the books were open. Right. And then another book was open, which is the book of life. And of course, they were judged according to the things that were written in the books. Mm -hmm. But... I think about those books, God's Word being opened on that great and final day. Mm -hmm. And in America today, sadly, a, a nation that at one time had, I think, tremendous respect for God and His Word, no longer acknowledges the importance of God's Word in the lives of people. And so in our society, we have moved, we've moved away from the ideals of Scripture. And yet, John is saying, Paul was saying in Romans chapter 2, that look, this book's going to be open. 
And, you know, we talk about as preachers, the things that we must preach, and we talk about the whole counsel of God. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have emphasized the judgment enough for people today? In some cases, uh, not. You know, in some, uh, I believe that uh, in, in teaching, sometimes we strive to be friends rather than preach the gospel, as God would have us to preach it. And, and in our attempt to have numbers and to be friends with members more so than a minister of Christ, sometimes we uh, evade those subjects that are unpleasant. But certainly the, the judgment is something that no one is going to, going to escape. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be a surprise to many people on that day that there really will be a judgment. But going back to something uh, uh, Don was saying earlier about our works, I think about in Matthew 25 when Jesus was on the judgment seat and he was condemning those uh, for not feeding the hungry, for not visiting the sick. Mm -hmm. And also he commended those who were saved. And so the things that likely will cause many people to be lost are the simple things. It's not really that difficult. Little thing, things that we do to show our love for our fellow man and for God, number one, in our daily lives. And you know, in Matthew 25, don't you think that mm -hmm. in, in that in that text, Jesus is saying there's more to there's more to being one of my disciples than just worship. Right. I don't think he's minimizing right. worship, right. but I think what he's saying is that our activities for his cause, you know, we've been saved to serve. And if we serve, if we serve our fellow man, then we are in a, in essence serving him. Right. But if we fail in that respect, then there's going to be a payday. I think about how many times. I think it's. I think it's twelve times, if memory serves me right, in Revelation chapters two and three, where you have the phrase, "according to their works." Mm -hmm. I think that's twelve times in those chapters. So it, it shows me the importance of our works. Now, of course, we know we're saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But those works perfect our faith. And if we don't have those works that he talks about in Matthew 25, what's going on with our faith? Right. You know, that's, that's the problem. And, and when those said, uh, when they're trying to argue with the Lord, you know, and they're, and they're saying, well, when did we not do this for you? And then, well, when you didn't do it to the least of my brethren, you didn't do it to me either. Right. And, you know, probably one of the most sobering passages is in verse 41 when he said that to those on the left hand, he will say, depart from me, mm -hmm. you cursed, in the everlasting fire mm -hmm. prepared for the devil and his angels. To think that you know, there is a heaven to gain, but there's also a hell to shun. Right. The fact of the matter is, some folks are not going, they're not going to heaven. Right. And that, that is a frightening thought in and of itself. And to show that no one has to be with the devil and his angels because God didn't originally invent hell for a man, but for the devil and his angels. So. If, we, if anyone is lost, oftentimes I'll, I'll preach that, that we have no one to blame but ourselves. That's right. I, I was thinking this afternoon about that very fact. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was thinking about, you know, God has made it abundantly clear. His desire is that we're saved. God wants us to be saved. That's right. And so if we're lost, it, it's because of, in, in many respects, our own will. Right. Yeah. We judge ourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. As did, and, as did the Jews. And we mm -hmm. ignore, ignore all the things that God has done, the Bible, Jesus, apostles, teachers, and even the, the life that we have in the day and age in which we live where knowledge is so free. If you want to know, you can know now. That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. But you know, and, you, don't have to, you don't have to live perfectly. You just have to live faithfully. That's right. Why can't people understand that? I think... They think, well, I can't live perfectly, so I won't try. That's right. Don't you think so? Uh -huh. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And, you know, John in First John chapter 1, verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, in other words, if we walk in accordance with his word, we have the assurance his blood continually cleanses us. We know we're not perfect because in chapter 2, in verse 1, he said, "My bre he said, you know, these things are right unto you that you sin not, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if we do sin, he said, 
You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, God is willing to forgive when we, you know, fail to measure up. You know, the same people that he said walking in the light were the same people that were sinning. But they were taking care of their sins. By God's second law of pardon and confessing their sins, asking God for forgiveness, and right. the blood of Christ cleansing them from their sin. Good point, good point. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. Do you have a congregational website? If you don't, if you're enrolled in the House to House Heart to Heart program, we'll design it for free. Did you know nearly 46% of people say a website's design is their number one criteria? for determining the credibility of an organization. 33% of people say the internet was the first place where they learned about their church. Put yourself in the place of someone trying to find a church to visit for the first time. Unless they have previous experience with the Church of Christ, they're probably just going to type church into Google Maps and look at websites for churches nearest them. If you're participating in the House to House, Heart to Heart program, your congregation will receive a free website. It will be updated with any events from your most recent issue of House to House. Articles will be posted from House to House to keep fresh content on your website. Building a location and service hours will be available. The only cost is to participate in House to House Heart to Heart Evangelistic Program. Contact us today so we can begin working on your new website. If I were to ask you how many churches exist in the world today, what would you say? You might say, I don't know, a, a lot, I guess. And you would certainly be correct with that answer. There are over 43,000 churches that exist in the world today. Now I want you to think about how confusing that could be for a person who is seeking for the truth. Friend, may I respectfully tell you that God is not the author of confusion. If you open your Bible, you won't find 43,000 churches you'll only find one. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church. Dear friend, our invitation to you is this. Let's go back to the Bible and be what they were, Christians only and a part of the one church that Jesus promised to build. This program is different from many other programs in that we examine videos that teach religious error and we expose that error in the light of the Bible. We always try to be kind and respectful toward those who we are looking at their videos and we always reach out to the speakers on these videos and we invite them to publicly debate us to discuss these things because we believe when we are dealing with matters as important as one's eternal salvation, you can't afford to be wrong. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Follow us live each week, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Hey, Pay Thank you for staying with us. We are back to talk about the judgment, and we appreciate so much the opportunity to discuss this very important subject. And so as we get back to our study, I think about the end of time, and we referenced Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus talks about coming with all of his holy angels and being seated upon the throne of his glory and all nations being ushered before him. That's a sobering thought. You know, Paul said that the Lord would descend from heaven with a shout, mm -hmm. with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. There's coming a day in which the Lord will come. It will be audible and visible. Every eye will see. The dead will be raised. What a sobering thought. And then we will be ushered before the very throne of God. 
And as I contemplated this lesson today, I thought about, you know, there are, there, I, I can't think of any instance where people will all be assembled together at one time in this life. Mm -hmm. But there is coming a day in which every person who has ever lived will all be together right. for, a, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. That's the judgment. Yes. I think it was Brother Taylor that had a lesson that was called, The Great Meeting All Will Attend. Won't be any no shows. No. Won't be any excuses to be absent. No. Everybody be there to do time. <laughs> and, and we've discussed, you know, you discussed or you mentioned earlier about God's judgment, it will be equitable. Right. He's going to balance the scales. And a couple of thoughts along those lines. First is God's going to be fair. You remember, you remember Abraham of the long ago said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God's going to do what's right on that final right. day. And then I think, the, secondly, God's going to be faithful in the sense that he's going to be true to his word. He's not going to, you know, God's not going to say one thing and then do something else. In our day and time, in our world, people will often say, you know, I'll do this or I'll do that. But then they'll change their mind, do something else. That's not how God's going to operate, is it? No. Right. You know, uh, and that's one, one consolation I have uh, when Abraham asked the question, shall the God of all the earth do what is right? He, there are many things I don't understand and probably will never understand about the judgment and uh, about God, in fact. But what I do know is that whatever he does, it's going to be right. It's going to be something amazing far beyond anything I could have imagined uh, he would do. I agree. Yeah, we're not going to be shorted, are we? That's right. You know, in the courts of our land, sometimes there are injustices. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes guilty people get off That's on right. the technicality of the That's law. Right. Oh, no. And then there are times when, you know, the other side of the coin appears. But with regard to standing before the judgment seat of Christ, there won't be any mistakes. And, and you know, people today sometimes pride themselves on having a silver tongue. You know, they can talk their way out of anything. Not on that day. But on that day, mm -mm. there won't be any talking out of the judgment or the verdict, I guess I should say. And, and, and you know, the Lord, oh, excuse me, you go. Now, I said the other thing is that there won't be any important people, the small and the great, right. are going to be there. And so all the people who have, are connected in this life is able to, you know, get themselves out of situation, not on that day. We're all going to be equal. I think that's a great point. Sometimes, you know, people of power, Mm -hmm. And yeah. people of great financial resources, mm -hmm. they can sometimes skirt the law. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I am so-and-so, mm -hmm. and here's my position. Doesn't matter if you're a president, a king, a queen. Doesn't matter. That's right. When we stand before God, everything's going to be on the table, and we're going to be judged accordingly. That's First Peter 1.17. Mm -hmm. Without respect to persons, That's right. judgeth according to every man's work. Yeah. That's, That's it, it, isn't it? But I think also, not only is it going to be um, impartial, which is what we're just talking about, but then on the basis of perfect knowledge. You know, you hear about a man who, who goes to prison for a crime he didn't commit for 15 years. And then the man that commits the crime confesses to it on his deathbed, mm -hmm. and they let the man out. <laughs> well, why, didn't the, why did the judge convict him in the first place? Well, he had, had imperfect knowledge. Right. He didn't have all the facts. And, of course, Jesus is going to be the judge. I think about John chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, you know, and, and he knew exactly how many husbands that woman had. Sure did. She had five, mm -hmm. and he knew it, didn't he? He did. Her, and she said, I perceive thou art a prophet. Well, you know, in Psalm 139, when David there talks about the omniscience of God, you remember he said, there's not a word on my tongue, right. but lo, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Right. Every thought, every word, every deed, God knows everything. And you know, that was one of the, the consolations that Job had. 
uh, even though his friends were miscategorizing mm -hmm. him, he said, behold, now my record is in heaven and my witness is on high. He knew that God uh, knew his deeds and God was keeping a record. He's the great record keeper in the, yes, in the sky. Is. And he's not going to put anything on our record that shouldn't be there. That's right. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that in a minute because I think you, I think you guys made a couple of really great points. I've got an email in from Wayne. Will there be different levels of rewards on Judgment Day? Great question. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to, normally when we talk about it, we'll talk about degrees of heaven and hell or degrees of rewards and punishment. Um, I'm going to address the punishment side first because there's actually more scripture on that maybe. Um, Matthew 11, 21, 24, he talks about woe unto thee, crazy, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And he says the same thing for the land of, of Sodom in comparison to Capernaum. It'll be more tolerable. Uh, Matthew 10, 14 and 15. Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I said you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Same idea as the other passage. And then you have Luke 12. This is in the parable of the faithful and wise steward. Luke 12, 47. That servant which knew his Lord's will, prepared not himself, didn't do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. And then you have the explanation. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. Mm -hmm. And to whom many have committed much of him, they will ask the more. And that shows us that people are going to be treated according to their opportunities, according to the light that they had. The one who's, who's ignorant of what should be done, is he punished? Yes. But with fewer stripes than the one who knew but didn't do. And this conveys to me the idea that judgment is proportionate. Not only is it impartial, as we talked about, but it's also proportionate according to knowledge and abilities and opportunities and responsibilities. Uh, James 3 1 is another passage. My brethren, be not many masters. American Standard says, of course, teachers, knowing that we re shall receive the greater condemnation. So, again, you have that lesson opportunity plus ability equals responsibility. Teachers have an awesome responsibility. And if we go and we start teaching and we start misleading other people, I mean, we're going to receive the greater condemnation. Right, that's, right. that's what he says. Now, what is, what is meant by more tolerable and few stripes and, and, and greater condemnation? I don't know <laughs> all about that. I know the judge is going to, they're going to be cast in the same lake of fire with the devil and his angels. But those verses have got to mean something. I right? I absolutely. And then I think about on the reward side of it. Uh, now, I'm not going to argue the, just give me a cabin in the corner of, <laughs> of glory land. Mm -hmm. land. I want my mansion, I guess. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? I want my mansion. But um, wouldn't it be the case, Mike, that some people are going to have a greater capacity for enjoying heaven? Oh, I have no doubt. I yeah. mean, uh, Paul's going to have a greater capacity than me. Oh. What, what about Stephen, you know, and, and James, who was beheaded, and, and these people that suffered so long? And so, I mean, they're going to have a greater capacity for heaven than, than me. Or maybe here's the Christian who's obeyed the gospel in the 11th hour of their life. Yeah. Versus the person that has been a Christian from their youth, they served, sacrificed the Lord all that time. You know, Paul talks about uh, like the Thessalonians, First Thessalonians two nineteen and twenty. He says, "Ye are our joy and our crown." In other words, part of his crown were the Thessalonians, his converts, people he converted. If if I go to heaven, and I believe I will. 
and I see this person over here that I converted, and I see this person over here that I converted, or this person over here that I had some hand in edifying or whatever, and I know, hey, they may not be there because of me or without me, without my influence or without my teaching. You know that's going to make me feel great. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That, that mental side of it. So whatever all that means, I know the judge will do what's right, and we're going to be judged according to our work. Well, and, and you know, you think about people that were instrumental in you becoming a Christian. Yes. And uh, there was an article that was written many years ago by one of the Nichols boys. I think it was Flavel. Wrote an article, and the title of the article was The Power of One. Yes. And he talked about the conversion of his dad. Really, I guess it began with his, his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then she influenced dad and he talked about literally the thousands of people that obeyed the gospel and who would have ever thought that one conversion would later lead to thousands mm -hmm. of conversions right and so you know the people that impacted us for Christ you know I, I think about the joy that I'll have to to, to see my grandmother Right. who was responsible for me becoming a Christian. Without her, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so, you know, the joy that I'll have, and I would, I would think the joy that she would have in knowing that she had a hand in me becoming a Christian, and hopefully and prayerfully, uh, you know, we've, we've led others to Christ. So it's a wonderful thought. Brother Robert, mm -hmm. I think you had something you were going to add. Well, you know, he, he kind of said what I was going to say about the capacity because of our preparation and... Uh, uh, some people are going to have a greater capacity to appreciate and to love the reward. And then Jesus did say that he that is forgiven much is going to love much. So mm -hmm. there is a correlation there. I think. Well, you're right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to come back to, we were talking about God's perfect memory. God mm -hmm. knows all. James said that we're to speak and to do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty in James 2 and about verse 12. You know, the Bible, and we alluded to Revelation chapter 20 when John said the books will be opened. Another book's going to be opened, the book of life. Mm -hmm. right. And when we obey the gospel, God registers our name in that book of life. That's right. But our name can also be removed if we're unfaithful. Sometimes people, you mention sometimes how, you know, there are, uh, there are injustices. But to know that God's not going to make a mistake with regard to our name being in the book of life or being removed from the book of life. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the satisfaction or maybe the comfort that we can take in knowing that if we do what God has said, our name is in that book, and on that great and final day, our name will be found there. Yeah, I like that song. You know, I know, I know, my name is written there. You know, uh, that gives us great comfort. That's right. Great satisfaction to know. We can know that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And, you know, Philippians 4 and verse 3, he talked about his co laborers. All knew their names were in the Book of Life. That's right. Let me ask this question. For a faithful child of God, should we fear the judgment? No. I don't think so. Something to look forward to. Okay. Heaven will be the next step. The judgment, and we we we. Yeah, you know, John out. talks about perfect love cast out fear. Right. And I, I know that there are there are people in the church that feel insecure in their relationship to God, mm -hmm. and, and there are some who have this idea that you know they're saved one minute, lost another, which no doubt would translate to fear with regard to the judgment. So, can you think of a couple of passages of scripture? that ought to give comfort, encouragement, if you please, to those who are in Christ who are living a faithful life. I think of 1 John 1 when he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And of course, we understand that the blood in the body uh, uh, eliminates germs. We get many germs that we don't even realize that we are coming in contact with daily, but our blood continuously cleanses us. So God understands that we're not perfect. And, uh, and so that's where there is some uh, grace, there is some security as a Christian. But because of the false 
teaching on security in Christ. We, we run away from mm. any security at all, yeah. but there is security in Christ. Mm. Oh, Mike. There's 105 verses in 1 John. The word no is used 21 times in those 105 verses. And, oh, we need to teach 1 John so badly. I think we do. Um, if I've got time, let me read just a few verses from 1 sure. John. Okay. 1 John 2, 3. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 3, 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Where's the doubt in that? I don't see doubt. Mm -hmm. I see assurance. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal mm -hmm. life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now that's blessed assurance. We've yes. got people singing about it, and they don't believe it. Right. They don't believe what they're singing. You're right. You know, and so our hope is not, it's not in ourselves, it's not in our ability it's in Christ. It's in the capability of His blood to forgive us of our sins. It's in God and the reliability of His promises. It's in the Holy Spirit and His accurate revelation of, of God's plan to save us. That's right. Um, one other passage. 1 John three nineteen and, and through 21. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him for, and I love this right here, Mike, for if our heart condemn us, see that's that doubt creeping in. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Now think about that because sometimes we're afraid of the judgment and we feel condemned. You know, you think about that publican in Luke 18. Now he wanted to do what was right in sight of God. Sure did. But you know, he, he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say about him? He said, this man went down to his house. Justified. Justified. Now, at the judgment, uh, I'm not going to be innocent. All have sinned. But I'm going to be justified, just as if I'd never sinned, because of the blood of Christ. And that's why we can have, you know, this assurance. We can stand justified in the judgment, Right. and make it the greatest day of our lives instead of some kind of day that we dread. I agree. I had a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, who was dying of cancer, uh, been a gospel preacher for many years, and he told me uh, two months before he died, he said, I've come to the conclusion that it is confidence that the blood of Christ will do what God said it will do. That's right. And that's, and, and that's the assurance we need. And you know, when I read Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he's talking about, you know, death's imminent. But he said, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I don't see any wondering, any wavering in his faith, right. but rather there is just this rock solid faith that God will do what he said to do. And you know, in 1 John 2, John said, this is the promise that he's promised to us. What is it? Eternal, Eternal life. Mm -hmm. So there it is. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. Every time I leave my house, there's a small possibility that maybe that will be the last time that I walk through that door. Remember who it is that you were created to serve. Remember what he did for you. We're simply so generous in this short life until that great day when we leave these earthly tents and finally be home.
So how do you know whether your Bible has been corrupted? You know, the youngest part of the Bible is about 2,000 years old. It's an old book. And it came from Greek, went into Latin, and then to English. So it's kind of like the game telephone, right? So how many of you know why we can actually trust the Bible? Anybody think it's been corrupted? Anybody want to maybe try to explain this one to us? I never checked to see if the things I'd always believed were in there. So test everything. We examine videos that teach religious error and we expose that error in the light of the Bible. Because we believe when we are dealing with matters as important as one's eternal salvation, you can't afford to be wrong. Jesus basically said that the only way that you're you're going to go to hell is over his dead body, so to speak. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People like, say that, you know, yeah, yeah. over my dead body. Yeah, yeah. Literally, that's what he did. Yeah. You can watch the latest episodes after tonight's show. To find out more, visit GBNTV.org. We are so glad that you've been with us this hour. We are back for our final segment. We got about 11 minutes left. We are so thankful to have Mike McDaniel, Robert Williams with us tonight. You guys appreciate so much your Bible knowledge, your love for God, and the great things that you've shared thus far in our study. I want us maybe to pick up in this last segment and talk for a moment or two about, I know that there are Christians sometimes that are concerned about the judgment. Passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul talks about we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to give an account of the deeds done in the body according to what we've done, whether good or bad. And so sometimes people ask, well, if I'm a Christian, is God going to bring up all of my past? Or what does that mean to me based on what Paul said in writing to the church at Corinth? You know, God knows all of our secret things. Uh, you know, that's what people are worried about, isn't it? And, and, and those things, all those unforgiven sins, they're going to be brought to light on the day of judgment. You can't, have, you can't hide anything from God, right? right. God knows everything. Um, Hebrews 4.13, neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight, but all mm -hmm. things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In 1 Timothy 5.24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men, they follow after. That's right. You know, so you can hide your sin from man, but you can't hide it from God. God, God knows what we read. God knows what we see. God knows what we think. You might hide your hostile feelings towards somebody else, but you can be sure one thing, God knows about them. So the thing is, you've got to, you've got to take care of those things. That's right. You've got, to, you've got to take care of those things with the blood of Christ. You've got to confess your sins. I mean, when you go to bed, before you go to bed at night, you need to confess what you know about and ask God to take care of what you don't know about. That's true. By the blood of Jesus and then pillow your head that night knowing you've done what God wants you to do. And, and you're walking in the light, and you're, you're sowing to the Spirit. And Romans 8, you're walking after the Spirit. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I look at, I look at Romans 8, and I look at w walking after the Spirit, and I look at 1 John walking in the light, and you're going in a direction, aren't you? If, if I'm walking somewhere, I'm going in, in a certain direction. And, and what am I doing? 
Well, I'm walking toward heaven. I'm in a journey toward heaven. I'm walking in the light. I'm walking according to the Spirit. Uh, I know the, the direction of my life. I know you heard the story about Einstein, haven't you? You heard the story about Einstein? I don't think so. You know, smart man, right? Yeah. Uh, Einstein's on a train. Mm -hmm. And conductor comes by. He asks Einstein for his ticket. He reaches in the pocket, reaches, can't find his ticket. He said, this is okay, Mr. Einstein. I, I know who you are. And he goes on and he takes other ticket. As he's about to leave the car, he turns around and Mr. Einstein is down on his hands and knees in the floor of the car trying to find his ticket. He goes back to Mr. Einstein and he said, Mr. Einstein, don't worry about your ticket. He says, I know, I know who you are. He said, yes, I know who I am too. <laughs> But I don't remember where I'm going. <laughs> he wanted his ticket yeah. so he could remember where he was going. Well, uh, I know where I'm going. Christians ought to know where they're going. We ought to know the direction of our life. Now, when, I, when I'm at the judgment, I don't have to worry about my past sins. When, when, when the Apostle Paul is there before the judgment bar of God, is God going to bring up all the things that he did persecuting the church? In fact, he was persecuting Jesus. That's what Jesus That's said on the road. That's true. You know, you, you're persecuting me, right? Well, is God bringing all that up? No. Why? Yeah. Because he was forgiven. That's right. And he knew it. And he said, I, I was chief of sinners, worst in the world, but God, God, forgave me. He knew I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He pled the blood of Christ. He was forgiven for his sins for the blood of Christ. You know, you know I often teach that repentance is the greatest tool that God has given to mm -hmm. us. And all we have to do is use it. So many people won't humble themselves and just repent. If we repent, God wants us to be saved. That's right. In, in the book of 1 Timothy 2 and verse 3 and 4, uh, where Paul told Timothy, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not slack concerning his promises, that uh, some men, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, what? Not willing that any should perish. So God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be saved. And uh, the thing I've learned, uh, and I've been a Christian now for about 40 years, and I've learned that my salvation is, more on the grace of God than on what I do. Yeah. If I look at myself, I'll never be good enough. Yeah. It's only right. by the grace of God. And, and I do, good. and you do what you yeah. do because of the grace right. of God in our life. Right. And that's exactly what Paul that's did, right. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And yet Paul lived with that air of confidence. You know, he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain, to that's part right. be with Christ far better. And so Paul looked forward to that day when he would be in the presence of Almighty God. That's right. And we ought to as well. And think about the fact he was a murderer. You, you think about taking warrants to Damascus? Oh, I know. How those people arrested When, when Stephen, I mean, jail. he was an accessory to murder. When Stephen was put to death, they laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Uh, you know, he even said he'd been a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. He mm -hmm. said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But then he, he countered that by saying, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Well, what about these people? I, I know my daddy and I, we went to see a dear man. Wife was a faithful Christian. Man was not. Man said he had fought in World War II. And he killed some people. And because of that, he thought he couldn't be a Christian. He didn't think God would forgive him. He thought he had sinned so greatly that God would never forgive him, that he didn't have an opportunity to be saved. Well, Tragedy. look, at, I know it is. Look at the Apostle Paul. I mean, if, if anybody shouldn't have an opportunity, <laughs> maybe it was him. And yet God gave him an opportunity to be saved. You know, when we have bad things in our life, we just need to think about the Apostle Paul. Are you worse than Paul was? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I well, mean, who is? You know, and, and the, the beauty of Scripture is God's yeah. willing to forgive any sin and all sin. Yes. Uh, he has the ability. He's the great physician. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So God has that ability. 
I, I guess as we sum up our study tonight, what would you say to somebody as they think about the judgment? Um, there's a song we sing, Careless Soul, Why Will You Linger? Um, you know, unprepared to meet thy God. We've got to be prepared. I mean, we'll, we'll prepare ourselves if we're going on a trip to the mountains or to the beach, and yet we won't prepare ourselves for the judgment? Makes no sense to me, because you're talking about eternity in these situations. The best thing we can do is, number one, become a Christian by faith, turn from our sins, confess Christ, knowing that if we don't confess him now, you're going to confess him right. one of these days, and then you're not going to have the prospect of salvation. Right, that's right. You know, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And, and, the, and the word in the Bible is today, now is the time. That's it. And uh, Jesus said, be ready. That's the whole key. Amen. Amen. Mike, I know you've got a couple of things you want to share well, with I, regard to your program. I, I just, no, I just wanted to mention that um, I really have enjoyed being on with you tonight. In, in preparation uh, for this, I decided to preach a sermon series at Central and Crowlersville, where I labor, uh, a preview of the Judgment Day, and I preached three of the lessons thus far. I have two more to go, and they're up on our website. So if we have viewers that want to study more about the Judgment Day, my sermon series, the whole thing will be up, and that website address is www.centralincville.com. Dot org. That's central in org, And I hope and pray that it'll be a blessing to those that listen to them. Absolutely. And by the way, I mentioned your program, A Bible Answer. Yes. That has reached many, many people with the gospel of Christ. It goes into a number of states. Yes. Uh, it airs on GBN. And we appreciate so much you, you heading that program up. And uh, I know that, uh, I know that if, if, some of our viewers aren't familiar with that program. Uh, you guys have a website? Yes, we do. Uh, www.abibleanswertv.org. And all of our programs are archived on our website. We also have a YouTube channel, and you can link from our website to our YouTube channel and even search our scripts on the YouTube channel. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much for being with us, Robert. Appreciate you being here tonight. Mike, as always, appreciate you too. And thank you for being a part of our program tonight. We've talked about the judgment. It is a sobering subject, but we certainly want to give due consideration to that subject. Hope to see you back here again next week. Until then, may the Lord bless and keep you. God bless you. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.